symposiums uh, in, at a U.S. convention, and I notice quite a few of you uh, who are attending today. I believe you're from, you might not be speaking English, right? Hola. Okay, so we do some, have, have some Hispanic one. I'm assuming you will understand English because I understand we don't have any uh, translations or translators. So is Scott in the room? No, he's disappeared. Because if anything that you don't understand, please go and ask Scott Schwartz. Okay? So, but um, for, for, for now, I apologize if, if our English tends to get away from you and uh, you might miss some of the things because I suspect as we speak, as scientists, and, and physicians uh, later on, you might be hearing a little bit more technical English language, which in other words, they are probably words that we invented and uh, nobody understands them. It's like a secret code that we use to talk to each other and it becomes a bit difficult. Um, so I apologize for that too. So, um, it, uh, well, I'm not quite sure what I'm doing up here, but let me... <laughs> I think what, for, for this particular healthcare professionals, I think uh, what I'm going to do is to give you an overarching view and a perspective of what we are trying to achieve uh, scientifically in the anti-aging world, right, with, with our approach, and, and give you uh, a rationale, if you will, uh, why we're doing things and how we're doing it. And then following on, Mark, Helen, Angela, they will come and perhaps give you an, an, an analogous equivalent to a grand round. So they'll present you some case studies so that, uh, or case report on certain products and, and how we develop those products and again give you the scientific uh, basis of, of, in terms of how we develop that particular product. So you can see perhaps at the end of this particular session uh, that you have a good idea that uh, there is mad, there's some logic to our madness and, and uh, that, that we do try to use a scientific approach. Fundamentally, I think for many of you, when, when we talk about science, it tends to go over a lot of people's heads. And, but I, I think the objective is that science by definition is something that we have to do. In other words, we have to conduct the scientific slash clinical studies. We, we cannot just say we are doing science, we actually have to do the science. And uh, the reason why I mention that and emphasize that is because that you will hear from other competitive companies that they too have a scientific approach, but most likely much of that is either just purely from the scientific literature or it's based on anecdotal uh, evidence or sort of reports. So we, we do use them, but it is just a starting point for us, rather than the end of our product development. Right. When you look at new skin over the last few years, I think you're beginning to see that we are indeed uh, becoming an anti-aging company. And uh, the reason I think uh, we are rather proud to stay in this particular space is because we have a very robust uh, product category, both in skincare and also in supplement. I think it's beauty from the outside and beauty from the inside. And I think most of us would recognize and acknowledge that uh, if you don't take care of the body from the inside, it is very unlikely that your skin is going to look healthy and good as well. So, and that is why we have so much focus on it. And in fact, when you look around uh, the landscape, you would see that we are the only company that would be able to provide and do the science in both categories. Uh, many of you have visited the Innovation Center, and, and, and I think what you should see there is really a $100 million state-of-the-art product development innovation center, together with IT and so on as well. But the more important thing that you don't see is that this is a building that you sort of created through you. 
And again, this is an unusual industry and a, a unique company uh, that's called Nilskin because at least more than half of it belongs to all of you and it is not possible to put this building up and invest that kind of money in an innovation center uh, without your participation. So for our intents and purposes, it is your building just as much as the, uh, the scientists feel very comfortable now uh, working in, that, uh, in those labs. So uh, I, I think it's also important then to look at the slogan that we talked about the difference demonstrated that to the scientists anyway is more than just a slogan. Uh, it is something that we try to uh, adhere to to the extent possible because we don't say what we do, or what we don't, don't say what we say, we do what we say. And again, because it is part and parcel of the scientific DNA. So, and, and again, as you go through the presentations, I'm hoping that when you walk out of here, you have sufficient uh, confidence that we are doing the science that we say we're doing. And this is because of this motley crew that we have here, right? I mean, you've seen many of the scientists, and uh, the important thing is not just the quantity or the number of scientists that we have, is that they come from various and uh, scientific disciplines. And, and you can't do science nowadays with just one pharmacologist or one nutritionist. It takes a team. It's almost to quote Hillary Clinton, I guess, it takes a village, right? For us, it does take a village uh, to do the science. So it's much more important to us and, and for you to really recognize the, the reality that what we have in these scientists are all sorts of scientific expertise that we aggregate them together so that uh, they, they can produce and develop the product. It, it cannot be just one particular scientist. Because I tend to see a lot of presentations, a lot of marketing material, if you will, that's been put out by many companies when they say that it's a science-based company and they put a, a guy in a lab coat, a white lab coat, and I say, that's our scientist, it looks good, right? So I say, yeah, it looks good. <laughs> but what they don't tell you is that in the evening when the office shuts down, that person tends to put on a brown lab coat because he tends to need to clean the floors as well. <laughs> it's quite difficult to have that kind of uh, confidence and credibility. When we talk about anti-aging, at the highest level, when I think about aging, we can't stop time. It's not, a, it's not something we can do, right? So we are going to get old. 12 months from now, you're going to be a year older, I'm going to be a year older, but not being old is what we are focusing on. Because what we're now trying to focus on is to dissect and to decouple chronological aging from biological aging. Fundamentally, that's what we're trying to do with our products. Because if you can do that and decouple those two types of aging, then I think we have a very good chance of not being old. So that's, that's a really important thing. And we do that, not just at looking at this particular clock, but really looking at the fundamental building block of the body, and that's the DNA molecule. And uh, we, we were since learned, since 2003, uh, we comprise of about 25,000 genes, and uh, every cell in our body uh, essentially includes and has this particular 25,000 genes. And indeed, if I take a bit of skin tissue from you, I most likely would be able to clone you. Right? But there are a lot of ethical issues associated with that. So most likely Tyler is here and, and he's not willing to let new skin to go and clone a human being. So, but that's the reality. We, we have the information now, the genetic information, to be able to do a lot of wonderful things. But the genes themselves are not really what we're really interested in, in, in terms of its structure. What we're really interested in would be the activity or the functionality of those genes. It's the expression, how those genes express themselves is what is of most interest to us. Because if they're not expressed correctly, then we're going to age. Right? So we are not talking about genetic mutation, because that kind of structural change 
it's much more associated with another class of condition that's called cancer. And that would be much left to my other more esteemed colleagues uh, to look at to see how they can actually via gene therapy or, or some other structural improvement of the gene that they can, re uh, they can prevent or in fact cure cancer. So that's an entirely different genetic research and, and it's not something that we can focus on. Aging, by, by contrast, I think up to this point, we believe at least it is not a disease and it's part and parcel of life, but if we can slow it or we can somehow influence how we age, and uh, then we'll be going into the world of uh, prevention, as Michael alluded to, and, and at least delay the onset of many of these other maladies that we might encounter in our old age. So age law, a word that we coin, uh, is how we are redefining and, and we, the, the way of the aging process, both on the skin and the inside. And, and fundamentally, as you listen to the scientists as they speak, right, we are going to, you're going to hear about that we are deviating now. We are progressing away from looking and alleviating symptoms of aging. We are much more interested at looking at the sources of aging, and that's where the genes are found. We believe now we have gone so far upstream now of the aging process, and that is where uh, the aging process starts, and that is at the genetic level. So, if you think about it, if you just spend a couple of seconds thinking about this upstream approach, then I think you're beginning to realize why we are excited. Because if you can cut it off at the faucet, if you will, uh, then you can imagine that you will have a lot of positive ramifications by that particular intervention. So, we are looking at the sources of aging rather than the symptoms. And, and up to now, most companies tend to still focus on the science of aging, but we don't. And once again, conceptually, when I look at aging, it's really a simple equation, right? When we were young, the ability, the intrinsic ability of a tissue to repair itself is robust enough to repair the damage that occurs. Invariably, there is tissue damage throughout our lives. But our ability to repair is in equilibrium. And therefore, we can stay young. By contrast, as we age over the years, what happens is the repair processes, as governed by certain genes, are unable to keep up with the damage that occurs. And when that disequilibrium happens, aging accelerates. So that's the equation that we're trying to restore scientifically, if you will, the tissue and damage equation. And by looking at the sources of aging, we believe that we have a much better likelihood of accomplishing the particular objective. So you hear this word for nutrigenomics, and, and it's quite a buzzword uh, in the world of nutrition, and uh, insofar as you have pharmacogenomics, uh, we have in nutrition perhaps something that the genes uh, are very much related to how we feed ourselves nutritionally. So, and as I mentioned, uh, fundamentally when we look at the aging process, it seems to be very much influenced by the nutritional status of the body, and aging happens if we don't eat right. And I, I think even if you're not a scientist, you can see many, many examples of that kind of, um, of um, things, events happening. When you don't eat right, there is a high likelihood that you will age a little bit abnormally. Another thing that we begin to recognize, and it is through our collaboration uh, with Blankjet, is the fact that aging is a polymorphic event. And again, uh, I, I hear a lot, and I do get a lot of emails from many of you, when you start to cite certain newspaper articles whereby a certain single gene has been identified to be the most important gene uh, in the aging process. And if you can influence that gene, for example, telomere gene, uh, the telomerase gene, uh, some of you may be 
um, somewhat familiar with, uh, then you, you could get an answer to the aging process. I think our studies and, and the studies over the last 30 years by, by our collaborators at LifeGran uh, indicates that it is not that simple. The body, as it ages, involves several hundred genes together. And it is the culmination, or it is the sort of combined result of these genes either interacting in the right way or not interacting in the right way that affects the aging process. It's never about a single gene. It makes good press uh, when you talk about a single gene, and most likely that, that professor uh, is, is up for tenure, and uh, that will be very good. Uh, the, the tenure committee will say, wow, you have a paper in Nature, and uh, therefore you are uh, very, uh, you know, qualified to be a tenure professor. And then he stops working because he gets tenure after that. <laughs> anyway. So, that's just true, true, true. Uh, Nothing to do with life. I went through all things that way. Uh, um, so, once again, the emphasis is on gene expression profiling and not about gene structural or gene structure profiling that is that defines age law. We are really looking at the activity of several hundred genes at the same time. And there's a lot of credibility and, and credible science behind this approach. And, and one of the most important, if you will, would be these twin studies. When you look at some of these twins, you can see that um, they differ significantly in terms of how they look and also physiologically inside as well. So, and, and I think that has prompted a lot of us in the scientific community, and there's a paper that was published in uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, Sciences on the left, where they looked at gene expression, and where they show, rather than looking at gene structural differences, what they saw and what they observed was there were dramatic differences in gene expression of particular genes giving us confidence that indeed we are looking at the right place rather than looking at structure, it's the gene expression that effect, uh, the, the, uh, the effect that makes influences how we age. So these twin studies uh, is perhaps the, the, one of the cornerstones of why many of us, in both inside and in academia, we think that gene expression uh, is, is, uh, should be a target for all of us when we look at aging. And these are the three musketeers, uh, or slash collaborators, from LifeGen. That would be uh, Dr. Jamie Barber on the left, uh, Dr. Thomas Trolla in the middle, and then uh, finally Dr. Rick Weindrich on the right. And they have collaborated together. They started this, this biotech company in Wisconsin. It's more than football in Wisconsin. So, and uh, so this company is called LifeGen, and uh, they deposited into this company all the 30 years of knowledge and, and experience and studies that they have in, into the company to start this company. So in fact, what we acquired in LiveJam would actually be, rather than just a single product, is a database of information, of genetic information, particularly related to the aging process. Right? So, when you have such a valuable database, and we begin and we're continuing studies, um, we are adding to that database, uh, we, can, we, we are keeping ourselves ahead of the competition to be able to better understand the genetic basis of uh, the aging process. So, as Michael mentioned to you, uh, it's the fact that uh, our central tenet in the h -lock approach would be looking at these so-called youth gene clusters, or rather groups of genes that have direct relevance on youthfulness. So every tissue in your body seems to be, at least based on the studies that we've looked at, is that there is a specific group of genes that govern that tissue aging process. Right? And that particular group of genes does not necessarily translate 100% into a different tissue. While there is overlap among the genes, 
It's never 100% identical, which gives us a lot, a lot of intriguing uh, hypothesis generation because that would mean that uh, in the future, we can look at, you know, we can be selective. We can either focus our product development efforts on a particular tissue, or we can take this, all these clusters together and see how we can influence the overlapping genes uh, all with one single product. So this is the breakthrough discovery, if you will, and uh, from LiveGen. And obviously, I mean, we, we, we may think we're good, and we may think that, well, we have found something that is really uh, interesting, looking at gene expression. And when we first talked about gene expression at age of more than four years ago, I think there were quite a few significant comments being made that is too good to be true, right? So you guys are just dreaming and, and, and really inventing something that that's not gonna happen. I think it's beginning to happen now because this particular newspaper article that came out you know, less than two weeks ago uh, actually described how Google, can you imagine an internet company such as Google is willing to invest $250 million into a genetic approach to understand the genetic basis of aging. So, to us, it's perhaps a sort of almost a little bit of validation of that the, the approach that we call age law is just not a figment of our imagination. That a company that no, knows nothing about biology saw enough in this particular, in this type of approach called the gene approach of genomics to invest $250 million into a startup company in the Bay Area called Calico. Right, just to study the aging process. So I, I, I think uh, we at least know that um, our approach is, is, is pointing in the right direction and is going to bear fruit as we go along this particular path. So I, I've, I mean, I'll just stack up this, this pyramid for you. Um, oh, sorry, wrong way. <laughs> so here, here, here are the essential elements of the h lock approach. And I think I just want to re-emphasize, if you will, the, uh, the fact that um, that 30 years of experience or the 30 years of knowledge related to the aging process, both ourselves and together with our lifetime collaborators, I think that is a significant competitive advantage for us and it's hard to, uh, to compete if you don't have that database of knowledge. And again, just to show you, uh, we have patents surrounding h -Lock. Every time Angela and Mark and Helen and all the other scientists, when they discover something and they are at the final stage of product development, invariably there tend to be a patent application being submitted and uh, we protect the product and, uh, with that particular patent application. And we continue. Every time we find something new, uh, we will be looking at that particular new discovery and see can that be created or be transformed into a barrier to entry, at least via a pattern. Okay. So here's a success process, and, and um, I think when Michael loved the success process because that drove him to sort of think about the 6P process, so it, it, it's good. Um, in fact, we, we coined this term the success process because the activity that we did, or when we used to develop our products, each of those activities, or each, at least each of those important activities, seem to start with an S anyway. And perhaps one day we can convert this to Spanish and it still be the success process. <laughs> so, but uh, I think when you distill what we're trying to do with the success process, is really to emulate what I did in the drug industry, and that is to create what we would call in the drug industry good manufacturing practices. Because when we first started Pharmanex more than 15 years ago, when we looked around the, com the competition, the challenge we had was let's put efficacy aside. In other words, not even ask the question whether the products work, is to ask the question whether the products are safe. After all, many of you as being physicians here, uh, part of your um, thing that you have to swear on 
before they give you your medical license was your Hippocratic oath. Mm -hmm. And 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 on that in that oath you had the phrase do no harm. So the mere fact that many of you are here, we want to make sure as a company at least uh, the products that we develop are at the very outset they are safe. And that's why we, we drove us to create this process that we call the success process, to make sure they are safe. And then we go and answer the question whether they are effective uh, as well. So you're going to hear some, again, some case studies along those lines from many of the speakers afterwards. So here we are, right? Health in the 21st century. And you look at the history of medicine, starting all the way back when we were living in caves, we were eating natural products. That's all we had. We had no synthetic foods. We had no processed carbs. We have no big food industry. We were scrounging, or at least we asked our wife to go out and scrounge. And, um, and, and the men, they tend to go out and hunt. Hence the reason why we are known as a hunter-gatherer species. And over the years, medicine has evolved. We think we have become very clever. We started to synthesize chemicals and transform them into drugs. And um, we, we sort of took those drugs and after a while, we, albeit we recognize drugs do have a very important role to play in health, but nonetheless, it's not a 100% answer. And then we are now returning back to our roots, pardon the pun. So, and, and but I think we're doing a better job now because we are now going to use an evidence-based approach to understand those natural products, to be able to see and to be able to identify the right natural products for, uh, for, for health. And rather than just purely uh, depending on empirical and, and tradition-based knowledge to, to craft our HLOC products, we're going to use the scientific approach to make sure at the very least we have sufficient data to prove that they are safe and effective. So we're returning to our roots. and, and, and it's, 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 an, it's an irony to me, but nonetheless, I think uh, it's, it's a productive irony mm -hmm. that uh, these natural products are turning out to be uh, at least important and significant contributors to our health in the 21st century. So that's, that's really what I hope to sort of uh, impart to you, some of these overarching, overarching messages we have. And now we can go drill down into the specifics of each product. And I believe our next speaker would be uh, Mark, is it? No. Yeah, it's Mark. And are you going to come out and say something important and productive? <laughs> or is Mark going to come out? Do you want to go? Jared is going to come out and tell you something really important. Thank you. Thank you.